are live. Hello, everybody. I'm hearing from my friends up northeast that the snow is coming. I guess that everyone's safe at home, that you're feeling good about that, unless you're our friend, uh, Mayor Brindle, who just let us know that she was in Command Central in her town in New Jersey. But let me say hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to Refresh and Refresh once again, especially brought to you by Teneral Wines. You know, this is our time to connect, be inspired, learn something, and, you know, ultimately feel a bit better for this time spent together. After all, that's what Generation W is all about. We gather today as the holiday spirit gains momentum. Are you feeling it? I guess if you have that snow, why does snow make you feel like it's more like the holiday? What happens if you're living in Hawaii? You don't have the snow. They have their own momentum, I guess. And wow, let me just say this. If you happen to see Telly Liang, just a jewel of a human, last week, I have to tell you, um, he really lifted all of our spirits, not only with who he was and his wisdom, but his talent. Um, Broadway star, uh, author, and star of a new Zoomsicle musical, The Nice List. Everybody, please share The Nice List with the world. Free holiday joy. I have to say, he certainly helped my holiday experience. And especially as I'm getting a little bit weary of reading how everything is different this year. I don't need to read anything to tell me. We just kind of know, don't we? Right? And when we know, we adapt and we adjust and we appreciate what we can. And I remember Gay Gaddis several weeks back saying, you have to learn how to thrive in the ambiguity. And I have to feel like, you know what? That's pretty good advice. I have to say though, we have spent such outstanding time together. I've learned so much from our outstanding guests, from their smarts and their generosity of spirit and from all of you who have joined us, I know jo Joy is on and Debbie, thank you both so much. I'm sure Trisha will be here soon and Kyle and Erin and Susan's here. And you know, what a gift we've given to each other. And I just wanna say, thank you, really appreciate it. It's wonderful how this community has grown and continues to grow and that amazing speakers are finding us to share their stories and their wisdom and field your questions. You know, that power of connectivity is truly a superpower. And it's always important, the spotlight on just how valuable connectivity is. And this is something we will long hold on to in a new way, in a new way, right? I recently heard referenced as the, you know, we always talk about the new normal as now the next normal. And I kind of like that, right? We, we see Refresh being a continuing great way to support all of us moving forward, support the great mission of Generation W, educating, inspiring, and connecting. And we conclude the 2020 season with a spotlight on a very important and concerning issue. As we know, COVID has laid bare so many of the inequities, the shortfalls in our systems. It's allowed us to see with new eyes, both individually and as a collective, our world in a new way. Like, you know, just who are our most essential workers? The roles of schools, healthcare accessibility, the issues around social justice, and yes, the roles of women and the disproportionate amount that women are carrying through COVID. Jan Healy, a newly elected president of the Women's Giving Alliance, which is a women's giving collective, and the CEO of a not-for-profit called Renewing Dignity, recently wrote a blog that I thought gave a great summary of the situation. You know, she said in September of this year, we've reported on this before, that 865,000 women left the workforce according to the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, accounting for, ready? 80% of all newly unemployed Americans. That's a staggering number. The pandemic has caused women to leave their jobs as they bear more of the responsibility, as we know, of childcare, virtual learning, elder care, and domestic tasks. And I'm sure there's many more that you are carrying and you'll share with us. The Center for American Progress estimates the cost of mothers leaving the workforce or reducing their hours to take on unpaid labor, and we're gonna talk about unpaid labor today, to be about $64.5 billion. And I would say that this staggering loss is not a short-term phenomenon, but rather begins this cascade of long-term consequences, uh, Jan said this, for future earnings, retirement savings, family security, and let me add, a significant talent drain for our economy and a rollback of much of the progress women have made with respect to rep representation in the workplace. As we cite statistics, we often think of the situation as something out there, right? These are numbers, ah, it's happening out there, but you know what? It's right here. 
It impacts our friends. I'm sure all of us can think of our friends who are struggling through this child care crisis, right? Or our elder care crisis. We should call it the care crisis in a sense. That's what COVID has brought us, right? Um, in addition to our families, our companies, our cities, it's all around us. It's not out there. It is very close to home. And I am grateful that trail runners and Kelly Wallace in particular brought to attention some extremely important and timely work co-authored by terrific researchers um, and knowledge experts by S&P Global and AARP as a result of this huge negative impact that we're all experiencing. So I'm so happy to welcome today. Hi, Lindsay White. Lindsay is the lead researcher and writer for S&P Global. She does a whole lot else and she's gonna share that with us. And Allison Bryant, who is sitting in her living room watching the snow fall on this most idyllic um, afternoon. She can share the good parts of that with us as well. She is the head of the research center at AARP, as well as the lead on enterprise digital and tech equity. They're fantastic women. We have a lot to talk about today. Where shall we start? Um, perhaps some context. So Lindsay, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit more about you and your organization. Sure, Donna, and thanks so much for the opportunity to um, be part of this discussion today. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a senior editor at S&P Global Market Intelligence. Um, S&P Global, if you're not familiar, provides data, research, um, indices like the S&P 500 and credit ratings for companies worldwide. And uh, we're increasingly doing research on topics related to ESG. That's the environmental, social, and governance movement, which has been gaining a lot of traction worldwide over the past couple of years. Um, to give a couple of examples, if you're not familiar with ESG, it includes things like how companies or governments are approaching climate change, how companies are treating their workers and ensuring employee safety amid COVID, and also how employees are, um, sorry, how companies are ensuring they have diversity in their leadership teams. I co-host a podcast for S&P Global that covers all these kinds of topics and it's called um, ESG Insider. So um, this research um, fits squarely into those topics as well. Um, I had the opportunity to partner with AARP and um, do some research into the relationship between family-friendly benefits, turnover at companies, and also company performance. And this is a topic we started looking into prior to the pandemic, and then with COVID, it just made it so much more relevant, and it brought um, so much more attention to, to the topic of how women are being pushed out of the workforce, um, how women are dealing with the uh, demands of childcare or caring for aging relatives in many cases. Um, and this is part of S&P Global's Change Pays initiative, which does research on women's economic participation and, and impact and the importance of having women um, play a role in our corporate culture. Yeah, I think we're gonna to wanna to talk a lot about that today. I think the emphasis of understanding how we all fit in and how we make each other better is really important. Don't you think, Lindsay? Yeah. Oh, right? absolutely. Great, okay, and? Allison Bryant, tell us a little bit more about you, if you would, and AARP. Absolutely. So uh, AARP is not just a membership card you get when you turn 50, just, you know, because that's what everybody tends to think of. Uh, so, you know, we're an organization that focuses on how to empower people to live how they want as they age. So we tend to focus on older adults, 50 plus. Um, and their family members. So that'll come into play a lot, I think, in the conversation today because caregivers are often not 50 plus. They certainly can be, but they're not always. So we do advocacy. We have programs at the state and the national level. We actually have 53 state and territory offices. We um, have services. We work with companies to develop products for older adults, and we're really focused across a whole range of social impact issues. So as you mentioned, I also happen to lead our work around technology and digital equity, so making sure that everybody has access to technology. But we also, and I think today we'll cover a lot of topics that we do a lot of work on, including um, things like work and jobs, right? So how do we look into issues around age diversity or age discrimination in the workforce and opportunities and entrepreneurship with older adults. We'll talk about caregivers, which caregiving is a huge area for us and an area that we've been doing a lot of work and we're seeing increasing um, burdens on caregivers and certainly COVID has been a, a tipping point for that, um, as well as things like savings and planning. So how does it affect 
people's ability to save or healthcare, you know, what they have access to. So we, we really cover a whole broad range of topics and a lot of them coalesce into this work that we were able to do with S&P Global. Wow, that, that, it, it's, okay, so essentially both of you, both of your organizations are really concerned about understanding from a data point of view, taking data to activism, if you will, or policy, to see how we can be a more equitable world, how we can optimize our own individual experience as well as our collective experience in companies, right? So you first came to attention because the lovely and amazing Kelly Wallace at Trail Runners International was working with you and she said, hey, I think some of this data is really important. And it is really important. So let's just start with the fundamentals. 856,000 women in September alone. What, what is going on? What is happening in our lives? Yes, there's a pandemic. Yes, we're being asked to manage a whole lot, but maybe you can give us a little bit more even granular than that. What are you seeing both by the numbers and by experience? Uh, sure, I can start by, by taking that one, Donna. Um, so we did two reports um, as part of this partnership with AARP. The first one was a survey of employees at companies across the US about the way that they're being impacted by the pandemic and that focused on employees with caregiving responsibilities. So either for young children or for um, adult relatives. And um, this should surprise no one here, but employees across the board reported a moderate to strong increase in their stress levels. Um, at the same time, employees reported a big jump in the sheer number of hours that they were spending on caregiving, both um, for parents and for um, adult caregivers. And, and that makes sense too, right? You know, early in the pandemic, many daycare centers closed. Uh, my kids' schools remain closed and all virtual nursing homes closed as well. So with these shrinking support networks, um, you had people's care responsibilities rising and stress rising along with it. And I'm sure almost everyone on here today can relate to that in some form or another. Um, and, and that sort of brought us to the, the title of our report, which is something's got to give. Um, a lot of times we're seeing that the thing that is giving is the woman's career. Um, we know that women traditionally carry more of the load, as you said, when it comes to household family care responsibilities. Uh, and that's something that really slowly appears to be changing in the US, um, but still the, a lot of the burden is on women. And then the other dynamic at play is that women so often make less money than their male counterparts. And that persistent gender pay gap, I think is a really important part of this puzzle um, because with what I think is happening in a lot of instances, what we're seeing and what we're hearing from, from women we talk to in the market um, are that you've got kids at home all the time or new caregiving responsibilities for an adult relative with COVID. And if the woman is the one, if, if it's a household with a heterosexual heterosexual couple, often the woman is the one making less money. The woman is the one who's already shouldering a lot of the care responsibilities. So often it's the woman who's taking a step back in her career, um, going part-time or leaving the workforce entirely. And I think that at least partly explains those numbers that, that you're seeing. For sure. How, how do we respond to that? Allison, what, what do we do? Yeah, well, you know, I think we're in an interesting moment. I mean, we've we've been really struggling to make you know strides on parental leave, right? I mean, that's sort of like one stop. So I think we we definitely have a ways to go in supporting parents. I think certainly from an ARP perspective and looking at the data we've gotten back from this, we have an even further way to go when it comes to looking at what we call family caregivers. That's people who are caring for older adults in their lives, usually parents, but sometimes, you know, aunts or even grandparents we're seeing right now because of longevity. And so I think there's definitely something to think about what employers can do um, from that perspective. And then I think we also have to think about sort of society and the social contract. How are we taking care of things? There was this great quote um, in the first report that, uh, Lindsay, I don't know if you were the one who wrote this, this uh, thing, but you know, the idea was what happens to the village that raises a child when the village shuts down? right? I think that's kind of where we are, right? And I would say it's a similar kind of idea for older adults. So I think there's the employer piece. And then I think there's sort of the, the society piece of, of what are we going to value? What are we going to prioritize? And then how do we address that policy? Yeah, I think that that's a really big, a really big issue. Who are we, right? Who are we as a nation? Where are our priorities? I think I mentioned to you, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Anne Marie Slaughter her, and her work her writing. Uh, she did a book. I can't believe it was in 2015. I thought at that time it was totally revelatory. Um, 
But what she says is our discussion must move from being about work-life balance to discrimination against care and caregiving, right? So in a sense, we have a corporate enterprise that has been, and, and our guys said this, we had the good guys on a couple of weeks ago to talk about being allies for women in, in the marketplace. And they have also an excellent book. And they talked about like, you know, corporations have been built by men to service men as best as they can. No judgment here, just let's understand where we are and how things are working. So when they have to work differently, we know how to make that different, correct? And that's kind of where we are. Um, we have families in this world and who's gonna take care of them? How are we gonna take care of them? And right now there's women take care of families much more than men. Some of it is, as you're saying, is because of the gender pay gap, right? Some of it's because women want to do that and we're not judgmental about that either. I, I guess the, the question is, what is your research of what can be mediated in this kind of rubric of a puzzle to make to create more equity? Well, one major takeaway from this research is the importance of flexibility and the way that employers, at least of the companies that we surveyed, and again, um, I will caveat that these are these are larger companies that we're surveying. Right. Um, but but flexibility is just so key. It's something that employees are seeking. It's something that they need, especially at this moment um, with COVID. Um, and it's something that employers are realizing that hey, if we want to keep our not just our women, but if we want to retain our talent um, for the long term, then we need to introduce more flexible policies. And so we've seen a lot, um, a lot of additional flexibility um, in, among the companies that we surveyed. And that's in terms of both hours that are being worked and also um, with, with actual like physical location of your working arrangements. Um, and just uh, another thing that we heard a little more anecdotally from people we talked to, and certainly something that I've experienced in my own life with three small kids at home with me all the time now, um, it is that this issue has become a lot more visible in COVID, right? So in the past, you might come to work, you might go into the office and sort of, or you might not talk about them with your colleagues, but suddenly for a lot of us, at least those who are, have been working remotely, um, you're on a Zoom call in your bedroom and you know my three-year-old wanders past in the background. So it sort of made these issues a lot more visible and not just for women, but also for men. And I think that sort of, um, that visibility has been important for making companies talk about these issues and, and take them seriously in a way that maybe in the past has been easier to ignore. No, I, th I think that's a really, that's a great point, Allison. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that we are definitely in an interesting inflection point. Um, I think the visibility is important. I think the other thing that we're seeing is that it's hitting people um, differently, right? So we've already talked about that women already were caregiving more both on for parents and for kids. Um, although for caregiving um, for adults, it's actually a 60-40 split, which I think surprises people sometimes that um, there's about 40% of men who are doing that as well. So I think that that is a piece of it. I think the, the sandwich caregivers, right? The ones right now who are typically in their you know, late 30s to early 50s who are caring for very, you know, kids, but also caring for parents. They're the ones right now that from a stress standpoint, I think are, are it's a very, very thin, thin string right now um, because there, it was already a problem before and we're seeing it just be exacerbated by this. So I think that group in particular, um, we need to really pay attention to. We, we, we absolutely do. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I would like to specifically hone in for a second on what are the flexible policies? What, what are the specifics? What are we looking at? And I believe we also have a graphic in the, from the report that shows things that have changed because of COVID that will have some permanence and some that might not. Um, I thought this was really helpful. Maybe you could talk us through this. So forget uh, beginning on mental health or self-care resources, right? This has been newly added with a greater focus because of COVID into offerings. And it looks like the, the gold is good, I guess. Gold is good. It means that most companies, nearly 95, 96% of them will keep mental health services as part of their employee offerings. Is that how I would read this? Yes? 
Yeah, sorry, that's right. I was just trying to pull this uh, up in, in the report itself. I see you've got it right here. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as you see, we've got a lot of new offerings that companies um, have made available to their employees in our survey um, in, in order to help um, with that work-life balance. Mental health resources and uh, self-care resources um, have been a huge topic in all of the interviews I've done with companies, with executives, and just with um, other working women. Um, this need for self-care, the importance of finding time for yourself um, uh, when you have so many other demands on your time. And so it's been kind of heartening to see that, that companies are taking that to heart as well and um, offering these resources and doing it in a way that, that um, so yeah, the yellow, the yellow on this chart shows um, what, what companies intend to keep post-COVID. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's um, I'm encouraged to see that, that they plan to keep, a lot of companies plan to keep those kinds of um, offerings available for employees even after the pandemic ends. Um, you'll also see on here other things like employee assistance programs have gotten more traction, um, employee support groups, um, as well as um, flexible work hours, like I, like I mentioned. Right. Um, okay, so, so listen, so this is good. I'm, I'm just interested, I'm looking at, uh, I just peeled third from the bottom, change to business travel policies. Not sure, there's temporary permanent. So nobody really knows what's gonna happen. On that. I mean, that's basically what, what they're saying. We have no idea. We really don't know about, we're getting a lot of feedback on people working from home, flexibility there, which is what we're talking about, what we need now. But moving forward, we don't really know. This is, this is not a vote that says, yes, everybody's staying home like Google says. That's not what we're seeing here. But what we are seeing is employee assistant pro programs. And what you found was flexible work hours. If you look there, um, that that is more permanent, that there will be more flexibility to work. And so the question came back from Erin, who we, um, is dealing with these kinds of issues and says, pressure has increased, even though she has a flexible schedule, because workload is still heightened, right? There's still a lot of work. Um, workers still have to get it done, even if your schedule is shortened or you have less hours. So how do you manage that as an employer? Are they going to scale back work demands when, on flexible schedules? Or basically, it's, I read something yesterday. It says, listen, we'll give you the time you need to do what you do, but we're going to trust you to do what we need you to do as well. And I think that trust element actually is really critical. Um, I also think it's interesting, and, and just to refer back to that chart real quick, um, if you, if you notice that, that that bottom section you were talking about that was primarily still blue with a little bit of green, those were sort of the how we get stuff done, right? Those are really more internal company workings. The top part were, um, they were resources. That center section, which there was a lot in flux there, those are the things that are sort of deeper policies, right? Those are things like paid sick days or family leave. I mean, those are things that to me have a little bit more if we could get them in permanence and things like you know mental health and, and self-care resources. So I think that's also interesting to look at too. Some of the easier fixes, I feel like companies are like, yep, good, we can do it. Some of these other ones, I think we're still in a bit of a wait and see, even though we're nine months in. Well, I guess this research would have been done you know, a little um, about a month ago. So maybe like seven to eight months in. Um, so I think that that is something to, to keep in mind when we're looking at the data and how, how companies are responding. And again, this is big companies. Yes. Right? So there's, there is big companies and we have to also understand, by the way, Joy wants to know, Jamie, if you can put this up as a link for this particular chart, because um, she would like to be able to spend some time looking at it. So thank you, Joyce, for that request. We're happy to do that. Uh, I also want to say, well, I can. Hi, Kelly Wallace. And hi, Mary Lee Kingsley. And, you know, mom, I'm so glad you're here because we're talking about caregiving. I feel like I am one of those sandwich people. And my kids are here. My parents are around the corner. And my mom said to me the other day, if you're not around a lot, then I... I, I tend to miss you, which is what she's telling me in the most loving way that she needs me. And, you know, and I need her. And you know what? That's real life. I have so many friends that we're all dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, but, you know, 50% of America is not um, working for big companies, right? They're working for smaller companies. And again, so how do we manage that, right? We, we have to have a culture of trust to get the work done. Um, but our lives, as you have said, we've been invited to each other's homes and we're not leaving. We're not leaving. And I don't know in some ways, is that good long-term or bad long-term? Or is it just is long-term? And we have to figure out that as the next normal. 
Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, if you're talking broadly, and this probably is, is for large companies as well, right? There are the economic arguments, which, and we have in the data here, where we see that um, more flexible parental and caregiving leave, leave leads to retention, right? It leads to employee happiness, right? There's a lot of really positive benefits that we see, uh, which by the way, are economic decisions, right? Not having employee turnover is a big cost or cost reduction for companies. But I think that, that the there's certainly really strong economic arguments to be made for that. Um, and then I think that there are, especially if you're talking about smaller employers, um, I think that there are, um, you know, support mechanisms that we can put into place that um, potentially can support them through, you know, policies or legislation. And we, we've, we've done some of that work, for example, with making sure that small companies have um, access to things like, you know, um, easier access to 401k plans, right? So we've done state legislation on that. And then on caregiving, we're trying to look at policies um, we've done some work with the CARE Act, which is really focused on when people first become a caregiver, particularly for parents who are coming home from hospitals, how do you support them? But then- <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about the CARES Act. I don't want to assume that we, uh, that we all know no, sure, sure. And it's the CARE Act, because CARES Act is related to COVID. <laughs> so I want to make sure that, that, you know, sort of differentiating between the two. So there's really, there's a couple of different streams, at least for AARP, that we've been focused on. And this is more the, the sort of social contract side of things. So the CARE Act is the Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act, which right now, um, I believe, has been, uh, some form of that legislation has been passed in, I think it's almost 40 states. Um that have, have passed that. And that's really focused on um, helping and supporting caregivers when they become caregivers sort of in that moment um, to make sure that they get information from the hospitals, um, that they're taught how to do things that are more medical. So that's sort of, that was the first sort of tranche that we did in caregiving. The, the next one, and this is now in play in many, many states, is around how do we actually financially support caregivers. So we know from our research that um, caregivers spend an average of it's about $7,500 of their own money every year supporting the person that they are caregiving for. And if that person has dementia or cognitive issues, it's uh, close, it's over $10,000 of their own money they're spending every year. So we're looking at things like, can we move in legislation to have tax breaks for caregivers in the same way that you have, um, you know, childcare credits, can you have caregiving credits if you're taking care of an older adult? So again, that's more the social contract side, but I think that's important too. We're not going to solve this. We can't put all of it on companies. I think companies certainly have a piece of this um, and always have historically, but I think we also have to think about this more broadly as society. Yeah, I, without a doubt, right? It, we can't put it all on companies. Companies have jobs and work to do as well, right? Being, um, Retaining their employees and understanding that we come to work as whole people is, is a great thing, but at the end of the day, right, there are, there are real metrics and jobs that have to get done and you need labor. I was going to say manpower, but I think we have to change that. We need people power. We need people power to get that done, right? Um, so I, I think we had a set summary. We put together a graphic. This is like, my question is like, what can I do? I sit here, yes. I want to help you do legislation. I want to support that. Stacy. we're into policy and advocacy here, which is pretty cool. Um, but what can I do as an individual that can help me kind of manage my stress level and be in a better place as a, a woman who is working, who has lots of responsibilities um, and doesn't want to get caught up, right? I want to be prepared. So I think these are some of the suggestions that you had. Number one is prepare to be a caregiver. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think this one is is one of the ones that we're really pushing for from a consumer perspective, and that is that um, caregiving is very rarely expected, right? Um, and here I'm talking about family caregiving. I mean, usually with usually with child caregiving, you at least have nine months, but um, but it's relatively unexpected when it comes on. That said, there are things that you can do. You can prepare for it financially, right? We save for rainy days. We have savings funds. Quite honestly, if you have someone who is becoming, if you have someone who's an older parent, you may want to start stocking just a tiny little bit away because very likely all of our data shows that you will have a financial hit at some point in time, or you'll have to take time off of work, right? 60% 
of caregivers are in the workforce, of family caregivers are in the workforce. So the, you know, those things are at play. The other thing is to recognize yourself as a caregiver and that this is a role that is in your life and it will have an impact. One of the things we see is that people are not prepared for how it's going to affect them emotionally, socially, um, even with our resources. I know when we've done research for um, the AARP magazine, which is the number one magazine in the world, we just surpassed people in circulation, I think two years ago, um, we often find stats of magazines in the corner of people's living rooms. Oh, there was this great article on caregiving, so I kind of put it over in the corner, right? Like, I know I'm eventually going to get to that. But go ahead and read those things. Go ahead and think about yourself as potentially being in that role, so that when it does come and it comes suddenly, you can handle it better. You can reach out to get support. There are great support groups um, online. We have a great Facebook group for caregivers that is so active because people want to both share their experience and their knowledge and they really need help in those moments. Okay. Number two is have conversations. You spoke about reaching out. I think it's tied into in your preparation, right? Understanding all of the interactions and elements that would be part of this preparation to becoming a caregiver. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say it's a conversation. So it's certainly the social uh, support piece that's going to be absolutely critical um, because we do see so much stress, which Lindsay referred to for caregivers um, uh, and particularly those that are in the workforce. So that's absolutely one. The other I would say is have conversations with all the important people in that caregiving relationship, right? So that includes people like make sure you're part of conversations with physicians for your older parent, if at all possible, right? You're seeing more and more headway, I think, in having, and that's what that CARE Act was around, about having information, being careful of, you know, private information, of course, and HIPAA, but having information that's gonna be really critical for caregivers shared, the doctor. So make sure you're part of that conversation as well. And then having conversations with your older adults, you know, or that you're taking care of, making sure that they are doing what they need to to plan so that when something happens, they, you know, they're not putting you in a position. And those can be very hard conversations to have sometimes. But what I what we've typically found is they're hard to start. But once people get in there, there's so much relief that comes on both sides, right? So sort of gotten through those conversations and the 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 sort of peace of mind that it's worth powering through those. Great, and then the last one you said, you said there's a lot of resources around. I think a lot of us, when we get in these, these situations, we feel quite lonely. We don't really know where to turn. I know that Perrin Rubin's on this call. She happens to be a social worker. She works with uh, patients in certain health situations. And I am sure that they all come to her. She's there to mediate, right? To help people feel like they're not alone. So what kind of resources as it relates to caregiving can we, should we be looking for? Yeah, so again, you know, I'll, I'll speak from uh, for older adults and, and Lindsay can weigh in on some of the other ones. So I think there's, what does your employer have? And I think, you know, pressing your employer to have things like caregiving leave. So at AARP, for example, we have over four, uh, over two weeks of caregiving leave every single year, just whenever you need it to take care of an older adult and, and now kids. Um, we actually added kids, which is funny because usually it's the opposite way around, but you know, we're AARP. Um, so, so look into employer resources. We're also seeing a move, for example, um, that some insurance companies are adding in caregiving resources. So I know, for example, um, United Healthcare has a caregiving concierge um, for some of their programs. So if you suddenly find yourself in one of these situations, you can actually call and they will vet resources and they will help walk you through all the process because it is different in every single state very often, right? Or even some localities. So there's resources like that. There's certainly social support groups, um, you know, ARP, of course, we're, we have a lot of caregiving resources, um, again, on a state level, but also on a national level. So just know that they're there, um, uh, bookmark them. So you don't have to go find them when you're in those moments. Right. So um, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come to you, Lindsay. But I just want to say, oh, Leah Jewel's on. Uh, Leah Jewel is happens to be an expert. Um, your company should both talk to her in in the global workforce and the future of work. Um, she's done a bunch of work with us on the Gen W stage as well as this show. And she says she agrees the burden shouldn't fall on companies exclusively, but there is low hanging. There are low hanging policies that companies can put in place to help. Um, you've referenced some of them, Lindsay, in the, in the research, I believe, right? We talked about this flexibility. Um, what other kind of things? Maybe, maybe Leah wants to let us know what she's thinking. Any, any comments from both of you?
I think we, we kind of mentioned that, right? Some of the days off, like right, in terms of time flexibility, hour flexibility, location flexibility. I mean, flexibility covers a wide swath. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think, yeah. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and it's things like having, you know, telework or work from home options, um, employee support groups or resource groups um, for parents in some instances. I know at SP Global, we have. Um, uh, and employee resource groups specifically for parents. Um, some companies offer things like reimbursement for expenses related to adoption or fertility treatments. Um, then we also have things like on-site or in, in office childcare in some instances. Um, I mean, there, there's a range of different things that, that companies can offer. Or subsidized backup care for minor children is another example. So it's through things like Bright Horizons or Kinder Care. Um, and there, there are a lot of different um, avenues that, that companies can offer this kind of support for employees. And I would definitely um, just, just second the idea that it's important to educate yourself about what is available to you through your company. Right. Um, you know, and I, I can say that from personal experience. When I had my first um, son, I did not even realize that I needed to sign up for the company's short-term disability in order to get any kind of disability disability payment. I didn't even realize that um, short-term uh, pre pregnancy or having a kid was a short-term disability. So I, I feel a little foolish now saying that, but but I wasn't as ed educated as I could have been. And I, I would encourage um, women and, and parents more broadly to, to just be educated and um, explore all the resources available to them. You know, but let's talk about the real world as well, right? So a lot of the reason this, this is hitting women so hard is women are frontline healthcare workers, right? So we talk about flexibility. If you're doing a nursing um, schedule, right? You're gonna have to be there for 10 to 12 hours. You can't just say, hey, listen, I'm gonna take a break. Now, what I think hospitals do, they might give you four days and they can they give you three days off. But in a sense, we have that. We talked about fast food workers, right? People are working in, now a lot of restaurants in many states are closed. Here in Florida, we happen to be open but you're not gonna get these kind of benefits for um, as a mom. You might get some more flexibility. You can say, I'm gonna just work 20 hours a week or whatever, it, 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 as it relates to that. You, you right, know, but that flexibility comes with no pay, right? I mean, not the kind of benefits that you would want right. to help support your family. But that said, um, I, it, it is a, it's a conundrum in, in many ways, right? If women made were in positions of making more money, right, then they would in that family deliberation, perhaps they would be the one that would stay working because then it's an economic one, it's not a gender one, but the gender overlay of being in positions of a gender pay gap, right? The different kind of jobs that women are in versus men for a variety of reasons, not because they may chose them, some of it's still, listen, culture, we're having a hard time breaking into boardrooms. I mean, I think you talked about the fact that a lot of this can change. There was some in a very compelling data about women in leadership and that how that impacts policy. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a starting at the top issue, right? Which is the more that you have, and, and what's sad is it really shouldn't be this way, of course. It shouldn't be that we have to have women in the boardroom and, and, and in executive positions to make that change. I mean, of course we should have them there, um, but we're definitely seeing that that is the case. And so, uh, so that's one of the things that I think that we need to do. Um, you know, I think also, and, and actually I just was looking at the chat, Joy just mentioned this, I was gonna say this as well, um, thinking about single parents, because that is a very large percentage of um, particularly a lot of the folks that you were talking about, right? Is that, um, that if we're talking about fast food workers, we have a lot of single parents as well that are, that are having those jobs. So they have additional pressures of not having anybody to fall back on. And then you have add that with the incredible incredible rise of daycare costs across the country. It, it is just, and of course it doesn't help right now in COVID because, you know, many of them have reopened, but a lot of them closed. So, um, you know, again, I think we have to hit this in a multi-prong. I don't have all the solutions, unfortunately. Uh, I wish I did. That would be make it a lot easier, but I do think we have to hit it from, you know, from, from a range of different, different perspectives because, because yeah, we're definitely not supporting those people right now. 
Right, and we, and we need to. So I just want to say, well, say welcome to everybody who's joined us. This is our last refresh show for 2020. We're here with Allison Bryant and Lindsay White talking about the incredible disproportionate impact of COVID on women at work and the research that their companies have undertaken to understand what it's about and then the policies that companies are embracing that can make it better for women. Now, this is a key question, and we talked about this when we got together, is how do you suggest employees articulate their needs to their employers? Because I think we all feel in some cases, in some situations, you know, a lack of uh, the ability to do that, or maybe we won't be heard. Maybe there's a fear of not being heard. How do we, how do we address that? I think one way that might be useful is to frame it in terms of how um, this kind of flexibility could be good for the business in the long term, especially I think if you're working for a small business owner, um, you, you want to be mindful probably of, of um, the limitations or the struggles um, of, of your employer as well. And I think that's where um, the research that we've done can be useful. Um, as Allison noted, there we found that companies that have more flexibility have lower turnover rates. Um, so they have, and then anecdotally we found um, just a lot of employees we talked to um, talked about the fact that they're fiercely loyal to their to their employer who maybe helped them through um, a time when they needed some leave. And I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, if, you're, if your employer sees you through um, a time when you need support, then you are probably more likely to um, want to stick with that employer for the long term. So I, I think if you can tie it back to, to that and, and the fact that yes, this might be an investment in you as an employee in the short term, but um, from the long term approach, this could this could lead to a, a stronger workforce with less turnover. I think that might be one way to broach the topic with an employer. Um, that's just my. Think, oh, I was just saying, and I also think for those of us who are lucky enough to have really great benefits at a, an employer, things like caregiving leave or whatever talk about them like you know praise your company publicly let people know that these things exist and every time i talk about the fact that we have this great caregiving leave because i just went through a really um you know tumultuous caregiving experience myself every time i talk about it people are like oh my gosh seriously that's a thing i had no idea so those of us who have those things or know about them talk about them tell them about your friends post about it on social media i have and i'm amazed at how many people suddenly like oh my gosh I should talk about that, you know, with my employer too. So I think even just that knowledge that that exists is important. The other thing is, I do think that, you know, we call it data advocacy, right? That idea of when you have the data and you have the research, it allows you to really advocate for the people that you're talking about, in this case, caregivers. And we at ARP, we've been working with um, companies, a lot of folks who are, are bigger companies like the S&P, um, you know, folks, but on a collaborative called the Living, Learning and Earning Longer, collaborative and that's all about how do we share best practices across companies to address these issues of age diversity in the workforce of addressing caregiving of all these pressures how do we actually come together as companies and share those best practices which includes things like the data about you know the, the positive benefits of supporting caregivers and it's there we know that it's there there's very in fact i can't think of any data points that are really negative in that respect right but there's still this really broad perception. Um, they're, they're really falsehoods that continue to perpetuate, I think. Well, yes, and there's also seemed to be this huge gap between understanding that children, right, the, the needs of parents of young children or children in general might, they aren't young and they spend a lot of time with them, right, um, versus the need for caregiving of adults. How do we close that gap? How do we, how do we broaden this knowledge gap as it relates to understanding that there's a lot of adult caregiving needs that exists in our world today. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, you know, we need to be talking about it because, um, you know, again, people don't typically even recognize that they are. And we've been working um, on sort of bigger, even brand, consumer brand partnerships to um, work with them so that they can recognize and talk about parents and their branding or show them in their marketing and ad campaigns, right? Some of this is normalizing those relationships, even in sort of mainstream media. So I think, um, I think that's, you know, definitely one piece of um, of the puzzle. Right. Now, I, I know, Lindsay, you've done a lot of this writing. Are you in a, can you share any of the anecdotal stories, perhaps, that you've read about women or either of you that they have submitted in terms of this research? Oh, um, 
Sure. I mean, I've, I've talked to uh, women in lots of different kinds of positions. Um, one, I actually I shared the link in the group chat um, to an interview that I did with um, an executive from one of the biggest hospitals in New York City and, and in the country. Her name is Pamela Sutton Wallace. She's a really impressive leader in the healthcare space. She actually joined um, the hospital that she's at now uh, in January this year took on this new role in New York City. And then like a month later, the pandemic is, you know, a month, six weeks later, the pandemic is in full force and she's on the ground trying to, um, I mean, try, trying to make sure that employees on the front lines have um, the protective equipment that they need. So just, she talked about really being thrown into the fire in this incredibly stressful experience. And at the same time, she was uh, really great to talk to because she has, um, two college age daughters who she was trying to from a distance they're they're here in Virginia actually so she was trying to ensure that they were safe and taken care of and then she has an aging mother who lives with her um, who is starting to have some some health issues as well and she she had to sort of balance all of this in, in this just incredibly um, stressful location New York New York City being a hotspot obviously um, and so it was just really inspiring, I think, to, to talk to her and to hear about how she um, is grappling with, with everything. One thing she talked about was the fact that um, a lot of us, I think, tend to think of work from home as sort of, I don't know, we, we sometimes talk about it like as if it's easier in some ways. And she talked about the fact that often we're working harder, we're under more stress. Um, she, she talked about working longer hours when she um, was working from home, you know, 16 hour days, she said, we're not uncommon. Um, and so she she talked, uh, she was one of many people I talked to who highlighted the importance of mental health care um, and, and um, recognizing the stress and the burden that, that the pandemic is putting on everyone. Um, she also, you know, you know I, I am a researcher and a reporter and I, I don't um, advocate for policy one way or another, but um, Pamela did talk about the importance of um, government policy related to um, pre-K and, and um, government in investing in high quality pre-K services and childcare. Um, she noted that countries that invest in pre-K and offer high quality pre-K services and childcare have clearly been able to demonstrate better educational and health outcomes for those children later in their lives. So I, I thought that was another um, interesting and important takeaway as we as we evaluate this whole situation. Yeah, we did talk about that. Like there is a lot more uh, progressive work done around this in countries outside of the US with good, as you say, good, good, good results. Um, perhaps we should be looking for other success models that could be adapted to our, our work models here. Yeah, and I, I think just having that awareness of um, the, the, the fact that other countries uh, do things differently and, and have success, I think that's an important part of the picture. Um, just because we do things one way doesn't mean it's always the best way. Um, and, and, and so I think that, that that's an important piece of the puzzle. I'm trying to pull up now. Um, we had a figure from UNICEF about the fact that the US is the only, um, I believe, OECD country. Sorry, one second. Um, so according to a 2019 UNICEF report on family friendly policies, the US is the only country in the um, organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that does not offer nationwide statutory paid family leave of any kind. So that refers to maternity leave, paternity leave, or parental leave. Right. Um, right. So, well, I would think there are a lot of men would want that. I do think that that is a galvanizing place for women, not only in leadership, but together to come to talk about how important that is for the well being of our nation and the well being of our children. I want to thank um, Eva Johnson for offering this. Um, I'm a single parent of two divorced, a high school senior and an eighth grader. I have aging parents, uh, 83 and 78, um, in South Carolina that she supports from North Carolina. Uh, I, I feel more, uh, I'm lucky my parents are around the corner, Eva. And even that sometimes I feel is too far away. Having access to information and how I can support my parents at each stage of their well being has been challenging. And that's what you were saying. Um, Allison, and I understand that. 
I do really understand that deeply. My mom and I tend to research services together. I think that's a really good thing. Teamwork definitely matters. And my dad is legally blind and no longer drives. My mom does all the driving. I'm thankful they're relatively healthy. Having an elder credit would be a great thing for me. Absolutely, right? Just a little bit more support, especially, which we haven't talked about, Leah Jules on the phone, on, on, the, on the call. I'll never forget, Leah took the stage and said, I just wanna let you know that all of your kids who are being born today could live to be 150. So when you think about that, we're seeing really people growing older, they're staying healthier, longer that we do have we, we we need to figure this out sooner rather than later don't we yeah and and you know and i think from a caregiving standpoint we're also seeing that <clears throat> i think the i think it's seven year old today um will have living great grandparents right so we're seeing because of this longevity right um that you're not just caregiving for your parent Sometimes it's your grandparent. Sometimes it's your great grandparent, which is just kind of mind boggling. I mean, one of the things that you're talking about compelling stories, we had this amazing uh, round sort of round table dinner with millennial caregivers recently. And the stories coming from them of feeling, I mean, they, just watching them have a conversation with each other and those, oh my God, I'm not alone moments. And I think millennial caregivers in particular right now are feeling very alone. They're at these critical points in their careers, their lives. They're trying, sometimes just trying to get their lives started. And then suddenly there's this thing that's put in their way and there's suddenly a, a caregiver, often a, a you know pretty intense caregiver for a grandparent, for example. We're seeing a lot of that. So, um, and, and none of them had any idea. We told them that a quarter of caregivers today were millennials. They, they were flabbergasted, even though they are living that. So I think there's so much more that we could be doing across all age spans and recognizing, and I think this goes back to what Lindsay was saying, that people just need flexibility, right? I mean, one of the things that I was, I'm concerned about when I look at the data that, that we released today is that, you know, we're finally at a point, I mean, I, don't, I, I should be clear that I think this is too low, that two thirds of these companies, these are larger companies, are saying that they um, are supportive of parents of kids under five, right? Now it's only two thirds. Again, I think that should be higher in of itself. Only a third are supportive of people who are caring for their parents. That's, to me, that's unacceptable, right? It's caregiving either way. This is the reality. This is what people are living through. And to say that either it's because they're, you know, same thing with parents and moms. Well, oh, you didn't birth the child. Well, okay, but you're still the parent, right? So yeah, it's, it's equity. There's, Allison, there's like piggybacking on that. There's also this real knowledge gap that, that we saw um, highlighted in today's the report that came out today. Um, we found 68% of companies that responded to our survey said they were somewhat or very knowledgeable about the needs of family caregivers of adults. That number was 94% for um, parents of young children. So, so that's encouraging on the, the parental side, but, but less so uh, and, and shows a clear knowledge gap on the, the um, side of family caregivers. Right. So I listen, I think this research is important. I think as we have learned that there is opportunities for flexibility and accountability discussions all the way around to make this more of a team oriented, let's create less stress, more retention, right? Increase loyalty between workers and there. But I, I, I still have this incredible heart and I don't know how we answer it today. Maybe we come back to it in a different way um, about you know, with, especially, you know, single moms working to take care of their kids. They don't have a lot of safety nets. We don't have a lot of social safety nets. How do we protect that very vulnerable but very important part of our population who really is the heart and soul of making sure that not only they're healthy, but their kids and families are going to be, you know, going to be able to progress in the world and in a way that they're successful educationally and vocationally and, um, Every, every single way. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm being as eloquent as I like, um, but I think this touches a part of our population, but certainly not all of it, but it does desperately and much needed talk about where are we as a society and how do we feel about taking care of our, our, our families in general, no matter where we are, working, not working, all of that. And I wanna thank you both for um, 
bringing these issues for all the work that you're doing. I know a new report dropped today, Lindsay, and it would be great if we can just get some of those highlights. We'll be happy to share them with everybody so they can know the newer perspectives that are coming out. If anybody has any closing questions, please, or comments, please share them with us. Um, at this point in time, what I would like to be able to do is, uh, what's Joy saying? Hey, Joy, what do you got? St starts early. Let's see, what does Joy have? I always love when Joy said, we need to show our children how we take care of our families, older and younger, so they understand. Hard to teach when they didn't see it. And I think that's really important too, right? I want my kids to see how much I love my parents and how much I want to take care of them and support them. And of course, I'm, I'm hoping that when the time comes, you're going to want to feel that same way about me as well, right? I think we all have. You know, to if I can jump in, I think that modeling comment is actually really huge too. Um, you know, I think one of the things is a, little, a lot of families, there's, there's not conversation between generations on things that are really critical. I mean, again, I'm talking about family caregivers, about finances, about health. And, you know, obviously people need to have their privacy, but people need to be having conversations between you know, adults, adult parents and adult kids around these things um, and modeling that openness of conversation. So they'll do that with their kids as well. I think that's really critical. I agree. agree. And if everyone stay with us, we thought we'd like end with that holiday joy and cheer once again, but I just want to say every season is a season for a nice glass of wine. Thank you, Joy. For, joy actually bought a couple of these and is giving these uh, gift packs out. Uh, we can toast the new year. Thanks to 10 year old sellers for their support of women. And right now, if you buy one of their three packs, they will donate $10 to Generation W. So, hey, if you need a good gift uh, and also want to help the cause of women and girls, this is a great way to do it. Uh, another incentive is our first guest of the new year. It is a woman entrepreneur on January 13th, market, market calendars. The founder of 10 year old sellers, Jill Ozer, an inspiring story truly of creation and desire to make a difference in the world would be great. You know, she can be here and you can all share all of your notes on how, uh, on how great her wine is. Um, Generation Wow, by the way, will be going virtual, FYI, with, Dult, with Duval and St. John's County Schools first. Uh, however, we will be rolling it out across the country. So if you have interest in bringing a highly energetic, motivational, and inspirational two-hour learning and connecting experience for teen girls in your community, by all means, get in touch with us. Susan Renner's on the West Coast. This is something we've talked about. It's so great that we will be able to now deliver this this incredible experience, especially in this time of COVID. Uh, we were so touched last week by Telly and uh, thought we should leave all of us with his song. Yes, it's a Christmas song. Um, and he actually adapted it for this 2020 season. Um, so remember, you can find all of this year's 37 inspiring guests in their conversations on Refresh Replay, as well as Telly's whole conversation. But right now, we wanted to replay this before we leave you. I'll be home for Christmas You can count on me Please have snow and mistletoe Under the Christmas tree Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams, I'll be home for Christmas, if only in my dreams. Here's the 2020 version. I'll stay home this Christmas. You can count on me. Never fear, cause I'll adhere to the CDC. Christmas Eve will find me on my couch right here. I'll stay home this Christmas, Christmas, so we can hug next year. Thank you, thank you, Tally Lindsay. Thank you, Allison. Thank you to our entire Generation W community. Thank you so very much. We wish you really such a great holiday season. Take what you can, celebrate as you can. 
A special thanks to our team, our producers, Sherry Levin and Jamie Valet, Stacey Kasha, Christina, Tara, Ruth, and Mariah. And um, by the way, the nice list, nicelist.com, go share that joy. The, the Zoomsicle is pure, pure smiles. So from our Zoom room to yours, we wish you a very, very happy holiday and we'll look forward to seeing you in the new year. Yes, a new year is coming, everybody. A new year is coming. Bye-bye and blessings to you all. Thank you.